paladin or a holy warrior is a very popular class fantasy that lots of people want to fulfill. If you're one of them, then you're in the right place. Because in this video I'll show you how to build and play a Templar tank in Elder Scrolls Online. Templars have access to a decent amount of healing over time abilities, such as Cleansing Ritual and Rune Focus. And because both of these are effects placed on the ground, Templars are better at non-mobile fights, where they can stand their ground, otherwise they'll be forced to recast these abilities frequently as they move. They also have access to Radiant Ward, a damage shield whose base scaling is already decent compared to other classes' damage shields, because it shields you for 30% of your max health, and then on top of that it comes with an additional gimmick, because the shield strength grows by 20% for each nearby enemy, which makes survival extremely easy when you're outnumbered. The Restoring Spirit passive reduces the cost of all their abilities, which includes ultimates, which means that Templars can slightly more frequently cast ultimates such as Aggressive Horn to support the group. To top it all off, the Sacred Ground passive grants them 10% block mitigation, which is a very important stat for tanks, that is also hard to obtain from other sources. Of course Templar isn't without weaknesses, the utility they bring for the rest of the group comes in the form of Minor Sorcery and the Purify Synergy, which are easily covered by a Damage Dealer Templar or a Healer Templar instead. I want this video to be useful for both beginners and experienced players, so I'll start with very basic stuff. But the video will have timestamps, so you can skip over that, if I'm talking about something you already know. Also, I have reused some parts of my Arcanist Stun Guide, because some stuff is simply universal for all classes. By the end of this video, you'll have a solid understanding of how to build and play an effective Templar tank, as well as know its strengths and weaknesses. So, let's dive in and see what the Templar has to offer. I'll start off by showing you all the skills that can be useful, and then I'll show you how to set them up for different encounters. Starting off with Templar's three skill lines, Adric Spear, Dawn's Wrath, and Restoring Light. We're gonna start off with Restoring Light, as this skill line has the most useful abilities when it comes to tanking. Rush Ceremony, an ability that heals you or a target in front of you. It's going to be your main instant self-heal, but you can also use it to save your teammates when needed. When compared to self-heals other classes have access to, it turns out to have a really good scaling, as the heal is equal to 15% of your max stamina or max magicka, plus 157.5% of your weapon or spell damage. However, it has one very big issue, the targeting. The ability can't target other people, which in some cases might be convenient, as it allows you to help your teammates when you're doing fine yourself, but in other cases will be a massive nuisance, when you're trying to heal yourself, but the ability targets someone else. It has a massive range of 28 meters, so the only way of guaranteeing that the heal goes to you is turning around, so that there's nobody in an 180 degrees angle in front of you, which can be quite annoying to do constantly, whenever you want to reliably heal yourself. The first morph of this ability is Honor the Dead. When you heal someone below 75% HP, you restore 18% of this ability's cost every 2 seconds over 6 seconds. This also takes at the very beginning, so over these 6 seconds, you're regaining magicka 4 times, so you're restoring 72% of the ability's cost. Since the ability's base cost is rather high, as it's 4590 magicka, this is the better morph. The second morph is Breath of Life, which also heals another target for one third of the original heal. It's nice and you may find situations where this will be useful, but for most situations the sustain you'll get from Honor the Dead will be vastly better. The next ability in the skill line is Healing Ritual, and it's not very useful, in fact I never ended up using it. However, I also ended up skipping this kind of abilities in my Arcanist Stun Guide, like the Healing Beam, and later found some really niche situations where they were extremely useful. So I wanna avoid making this mistake again, and I'm gonna mention even those abilities that I have never found useful, but I suspect might have some niche use. So back to Healing Ritual, let's simply compare it to Rushed Ceremony. It heals not just a single target, but everyone in its range. But the range is only 10 meters instead of 28. The heal scales with 11.25% of your max stamina or max magicka, plus 118% of your weapon or spell damage. So it's roughly 25% weaker than Rushed Ceremony. It also costs 5265 magicka, so it's 675 more expensive than Rushed Ceremony. And also, it doesn't have a morph that would improve sustain, while Rushed Ceremony can morph into Honor the Dead, which refunds a huge chunk of the skills cost. The first morph is Ritual of Rebirth, which also heals one target outside of the ability's radius, for the same amount. The second morph is Hasty Prayer, which grants everyone Minor Expedition for 10 seconds, which increases movement speed by 15%. Just keep in mind that Minor Expedition has many other sources, such as Charging Maneuver. And as I said, I haven't found a specific use for this skill yet, but maybe you will. Next skill is Restoring Aura, 
which grants you and everyone within 12 meters minor endurance, minor fortitude, and minor intellect for 20 seconds. These buffs increase all of your recoveries by 15%. You also passively gain these effects while slotted. It's a very good skill that improves everyone's sustain, but it won't be always necessary as these buffs have many other sources, from other classes' abilities. And usually those abilities also provide other stuff, while Restoring Aura provides just those sustain buffs. Let's take for example Arcanist's Domain, which provides these buffs and Minor Courage on top of that. Or Nablet's Refreshing Buff, which provides these buffs and the Major Expedition and heals on top of that. So, Restoring Aura can be useful, especially if you're playing with a random group, but in an organized group there's a huge chance someone else can provide these buffs with a better skill. The Radiant Aura more simply upgrades this ability's duration and radius. The duration increases from 20 seconds to 60 seconds, and radius increases from 12 meters to 28 meters, which makes it extremely easy to keep up. The Repentance Morph no longer provides this minor buff to your teammates. Instead, you can use this ability to consecrate corpses around you, and heal your allies and restore your own stamina for each corpse consumed. This can restore massive amounts of stamina in fights with lots of adds, but you should make sure your teammates have another source of minor recovery buffs, or ask if they even need them at all. Next we have Cleansing Ritual, an ability which places a massive AoE on the ground that heals you and your allies for 3.6% of your max stamina or max magicka, plus 38% of your weapon or spell damage every 2 seconds for 20 seconds. The ability is quite expensive, but the duration is very long, so it's not that big of an issue. This ability also provides a synergy for your allies that removes all cleansable debuffs from them, and heals them for 8.5% of their max stamina or max magicka, plus 89% of their weapon or spell damage. The special thing about this synergy is that it can be used by all of your teammates after being placed, while most other synergies can be used once per cast. This makes this synergy crucial in Trials, for keeping up penetration using the Alkosh item set. Since Ritual is so big, it's also the easiest way of proking a very important passive, Sacred Ground, which will increase your healing and block mitigation. First morph is Ritual of Retribution, which reduces the cost and causes the skill to deal damage rather than heal. The other morph, Extended Ritual, increases the duration from 20 to 30 seconds. As a tank you'll want to use this morph, as you don't want to lose the heal over time. Next ability is Rune Focus. It grants you major resolve for 20 seconds, which increases your armor by 6000, and is absolutely crucial for reaching the armor cap. It will also heal you for 2% of your max health every second during its duration. When cast, it places a small rune at your location. Standing inside of this rune will increase the heal's effectiveness by 200%, causing it to heal you for 6% of your max health every second. This skill, combined with Ritual, will grant you a lot of passive healing over time. But because the rune is so small, Templar will suffer a bit in fights which involve a lot of movement. First morph, Channeled Focus, increases the duration from 20 seconds to 25 seconds, and causes you to restore 242 magicka per second. But you'll want to use the other morph, Restoring Focus. This morph doesn't increase the duration, but it instead increases the healing to 2.5% of your max health per second, which becomes 7.5% of your max health when standing inside the rune. But what's more important, this morph causes you to restore 242 stamina per second, and the reason this is better than recovering Machka is because your regular stamina recovery doesn't work while blocking, which is why it's important to seek other ways of recovering stamina. Now let's take a closer look at the passives in the Restoring Light skill line. Mending increases the effectiveness of your Restoring Light heals by 12%, depending on your target's health, so someone at 50% HP would receive 6% increased heals. Extremely important passive, as Honor the Dead, Extended Ritual, and Restoring Focus will account for a lot of your heals. Sacred Ground gives you minor mending and 10% block mitigation while standing inside of your Cleansing Ritual, Rune Focus, or Rite of Passage, and for 4 seconds after leaving these areas. Rite of Passage is the ultimate ability from the skill line, which I skipped when describing skills because they are better defensive ultimates, such as Barrier, which we'll talk about later on. Minor mending increases your healing down by 8%, and the Sacred Ground passive is the only reliable source of it, as the only other sources are 5 piece item sets and the Oak and Soul Mythic. And block mitigation is a very important stuff for tanks, that is hard to obtain from other sources. The Light Weaver passive will grant your allies 2 ultimate whenever you heal them with a Restoring Light ability, while they are under 50% HP. Master Ritualist increases resurrection speed by 20% and causes your allies to return with 100% of their HP after being resurrected by you. Tanks usually shouldn't be the ones resurrecting other players, as they're usually under pressure from bosses, but it's still a good passive, and combined with the Spirit Mastery Champion Point, you can resurrect players very quickly. Next up we have the Dawn's Wrath skill line. This time I'll bring up one of the passives before I talk about active skills, 
because this passive will be important to know when discussing skills. The Illuminate passive grants you and your allies minor sorcery whenever you use a Dawn's Wrap ability. Minor sorcery increases spell damage by 10%, it's unique to Templars, and it's crucial to have. But now with hybridization it's kind of equivalent to Dragon Knight's minor brutality, which increases weapon damage by 10%. What it means is that if there are no Dragon Knights in your group and you're the only Templar, you'll have to use one of Dawn's Wrap abilities every 20 seconds to proc this passive, even if you don't need the ability itself. With that in mind, let's move on to the skills. First one is Sunfire. It's a very niche ability that will only come useful if you're using the Encratis' Behem of Monster Set. This ability deals fire damage which will proc Encratis. You'll want to use the Vampire's Bane Morph, as it increases the duration, so you'll have to refresh this ability less frequently. Next is Backlash. This ability damages an enemy and marks them for 6 seconds. After the mark expires, they take damage again, and that damage is increased by up to 200% depending on how much damage you've dealt to them during this 6 second period. This obviously isn't useful for tanking, but it gets more interesting when we look at the morphs. First one is Power of the Light. It changes the cost to stamina and applies Minor Breach to the enemy for 10 seconds. Minor Breach reduces enemy's armor by 3000 and it's a crucial buff, but even though it's crucial, it has many other sources, such as Pierce Armor or Elemental Blockade. Second morph is Purifying Light. What it adds is a pool of sunlight will remain attached to the enemy when the effect ends, healing your allies for 2.6% of your max stamina or max magicka, plus 27% of your weapon or spell damage every 2 seconds for 10 seconds. It's a rather weak heal, but it can be a decent option when you require to use a Dawn's Wrath ability to proc minor sorcery with the Illuminate passive. Next ability is Eclipse, but let's go straight to the Living Dark Morph, because that's the one we're going to want to use, and it changes the ability completely, so there's no point in me explaining Eclipse at all. Living Dark envelops you in a sphere for 12 seconds. Anytime you take direct damage, you slow the attacker's movement by 40% for 3 seconds and heal for 2066. That heal value is constant and doesn't scale with anything. This can occur once every half second. This ability can heal you for a lot when you're being outnumbered, or even when you're fighting a single enemy but they have a very high attack speed. It's also my preferred ability for proking Illuminate, as it doesn't need a target. So when there's no Dragonite or other Templar in a group, I always cast it before engaging trash packs in dungeons, something I wouldn't be able to do with Purifying Light, as it needs a target. Now let's look at the rest of the passives of Dawn's Wrath skill line. Enduring Rays will increase the duration of your Sunfire, Eclipse, a Solar Flare and Nova abilities by 2 seconds. Living Dark is a morph of Eclipse, so it's the only ability we're interested in that would be affected by this passive. So if you're not using Living Dark, you can save some skill points by not getting this passive. Prism grants you 3 ultimate whenever you cast a Dawn's Wrath ability, up to once every 6 seconds. You definitely want to have it if you end up using Dawn's Wrath abilities. Restoring Spirit will reduce the cost of all of your abilities by 5%. It's a very important passive that will boost your sustain by a decent amount, and it'll allow you to cast your ultimate more frequently. And time to move on to the Adric Spear skill line. First we have Piercing Javelin ability, which allows you to hurl a javelin at an enemy and knock them back 8 meters. You won't find this useful in a huge majority of the encounters, but there are a few fights, which happen on small arenas where you can knock your enemies off the ledge with this ability, such as the last boss fight in Frost Vault. You don't even have to morph this ability. Next we have Focus Charge, which is also an ability you won't find useful in the majority of encounters. This ability allows you to charge at an enemy up to 22 meters, deals a little bit of damage, interrupts them, sets them off balance if they're with channeling, and grants you major protection for 4 seconds, which reduces your damage taken by 10%. This seems like a lot of good stuff, but most of it can be obtained in different ways. Interrupting enemies can be done easier with the Crushing Shock ability, which also has a better range, and doesn't require you to charge at the enemy. If you want major protection, Revealing Flare is a better option, which also grants you passive magic recovery. Let's look at the morph options. Explosive Charge interrupts all enemies in an area around the target and increases the duration of major protection from 4 seconds to 10 seconds. This can be situationally useful when you have to interrupt multiple enemies that are close to each other. Toppling charge always stuns the enemy and sets them off balance, regardless if they're casting. Off balance is a nice boost to damage because it allows your DDs to utilize the exploiter champion points. In regular boss fights, off balance will be taken care of by lightning elemental blockade combined with elemental susceptibility, but in short fights, you can quickly provide off balance with this ability. Next we have spear shard. 
This ability sends a spear that deals damage and leaves a dot in a 6 meter circle up to 28 meters away from you. A single ally near the spear can activate a synergy that will restore 3960 of stamina or magicka, whichever is their higher maximum resource. Now this might seem good at first look, but it's actually a detriment because this synergy shares a cooldown with Necrotic Orb's Combustion synergy, except Combustion also deals damage on top of restoring resources. So the only time you'd want to actually use Spear Shard is when you want to grant a synergy to an ally who is really far away from you and can't be reached with Necrotic Orb. The Luminous Shard's morph reduces the cost and causes the synergy to restore both stamina and magicka, rather than only one of them. And the last ability is Sun Shield. It grants you a damage shield equal to 30% of your maximum health for 6 seconds. It also deals damage around you on activation, and each enemy hit increases the damage shield's value by 4%. I made a separate video about damage shields, and you can watch it if you want to know the details, but all you really need to know right now is that damage shields are great against damage over time, and bad against direct blockable damage. The morph you'll want to use is Radiant Ward, which reduces the cost and increases the bonus you get for each enemy hit, from 4% to 20%. The ability's description doesn't specify it, but this has a cap of 6 enemies, so we can get up to 120% stronger shield when surrounded by 6 enemies. So in the best scenario, you can get a damage shield equal to 66% of your maximum health, which is very strong. Now let's take a look at passives of Adric Spear skill line. Piercing Spear increases your critical damage by 10% and increases your damage done against blocking targets by 10%. You don't really need it as a tank, so you can skip it until you have an abundance of skill points. Spear Wall grants you minor protection for 6 seconds after using an Adric Spear ability, which 99% of the time will be Radiant Ward. You definitely want it. Burning Light, in a big shortcut, is just bonus damage, so you don't need it immediately as a tank, so only get it once you have spare skill points. Balance Warrior increases your weapon and spell damage by 6%, and your armor by 1320. It's extremely strong passive. The weapon and spell damage bonus will increase effectiveness of your heals, and the bonus armor will make it much easier to reach the armor cap. Now that we've covered class skill lines, let's move on to weapon skill lines. You'll only need two out of the six weapon skill lines. One hand and shield, and the destruction staff. Let's start with the one hand and shield skill line. The first skill, Puncture, is basically a melee taunt. It damages your target within 7 meters, causes them to attack you, and applies Major Breach, which reduces enemy's armor by 6000 for 15 seconds, providing around a 13% damage increase. This debuff is extremely crucial to have. Whenever you can't use Puncture, for example because you're in a double eye staff setup, you'll have to make sure there's some other source of major breach. The morph you want to use here is Pierce Armor, which additionally provides minor breach, which reduces enemy's armor by 3000. The other morph, Ransack, provides minor protection, which you already have from your spear wall passive. It's also worth noting that you can modify Puncture with the Puncturing Remedy set, so that each cast of Puncture will heal you for 14% of your max health. Next skill is Low Slash. The base skill only provides minor maim, which can easily be obtained from other sources, so it's not particularly useful. However, its morph, Heroic Slash, is much more valuable. It not only applies minor maim, but also provides minor heroism to you for 15 seconds, allowing you to gain 10 ultimate per cast, allowing you to cast your ultimate more frequently. It's a nice bonus, but in practice you won't be able to fit it into your skill setup in the majority of situations. Still, it's a good skill to have leveled up for those few situations when you do have the space for it. Additionally, you can craft potions that provide minor heroism with 100% uptime, but these require ingredients that drop from dragons, so the potions end up being extremely expensive. For example, the average price of one on PC EU server right now is around 5000 gold per potion. So, once you're rich enough, you won't have to deal with the dilemma of trying to fit in Heroic Slash into your setup. The next skill is Defensive Posture which grants you a damage shield equal to 31% of your max health for 6 seconds and allows you to reflect one projectile that would hit you. This can be extremely useful in some encounters, such as the Locustis fight, where you can deal a lot of damage by just standing away from the dragon's melee range and constantly reflecting his frost bolts, which damage ramps up, because they were supposed to act as a punishment for not standing in the dragon's melee range, or for example the Daedroths in Alice Archive. Reflecting their own fire bolts back at them will basically one-shot them there is only one good morph here, Defensive Stance, which reduces the cost of your block and increases your block mitigation by 10%. It's gonna be crucial for some fights, where there is lots of blockable direct damage. It's also worth noting that you can amplify it with the Defensive Position set, so that each cast of Defensive Stance will restore magicka. And the last useful skill from this skill line is Power Bash. 
This ability doesn't do anything interesting on its own, but it will be required for proccing the Void Bash 2-piece item set, which is great for trash fights and makes stacking enemies a lot faster. It doesn't matter which morph you choose here, and honestly you might as well not waste a skill point and leave it unmorphed. You'll want to put points into all of the passives from one hand and shield skill line. The other weapon skill line you'll need is Destruction Stuff. Keep in mind that most of these abilities have different effects based on the type of stuff you're using, but I'll only be talking about Frost variants, because that's the type of stuff you want to use as a tank. The first skill is Force Shock. While it's just a basic damaging ability, its morph, Crushing Shock, will prove to be essential in some fights. This is because Crushing Shock can be used as a ranged interrupt, interrupting enemies who are channeling their abilities just like a bash except it has a 28 meter range. This can be incredibly helpful in fights where the enemy is casting dangerous spells from a distance and you need to interrupt them quickly. The next skill is Wall of Elements, which is absolutely essential and you'll always have it on your skill setup. It places an AoE in front of you for 10 seconds, which deals a tiny bit of damage, grants your allies a damage shield against projectiles, and applies 40% slow and minor breach to enemies that are chilled. Minor breach provides almost 3000 penetration and we already talked about it multiple times when covering previous skills. But the real reason why you'll need wall of elements in every skill setup is different. Every weapon skill applies enchantments of the weapon it's being used with. You will want to use the crusher enchantment on your eye staff, which combined with the infused weapon trait will reduce your enemy's armor by 2108 for 5 seconds with a 5 second cooldown. Since Wall of Elements ticks every second, it will constantly proc Crusher whenever it's off cooldown, allowing you to provide 100% uptime on that armor debuff. Huge majority of the times you'll want to use the Elemental Blockade Morph, which increases the size of the AoE and increases its duration from 10 to 15 seconds. But the other morph, Unstable Wall of Elements, also has some uses. That's because it provides the damage shield also when it expires, so you can spam it to constantly apply a decent damage shield against projectiles to your teammates. I managed to utilize it quite well in the Black Rose Prison arena. Next useful skill is Destructive Touch, or rather its morph, Destructive Clench. This is one out of two range stones available in the game, and it's the better one. It has 28 meter range and always applies the chilled status effect, which in turn applies minor maim for 4 seconds, and also minor brittle for 4 seconds, if you are wielding a nice stuff. And it will also apply minor breach for 4 seconds, if your enemy is standing inside Wall of Elements. Minor Maim, as I said many times before, has many other sources, so it's not that important. Minor Brittle can be more easily provided by Arcanist's Rune of the Colorless pool, which lasts 5 times as long, but you won't always have an Arcanist in group. Minor Breach provided by this ability can be useful if you're using double eye stuff setup, and you don't have access to Minor Breach from Pierce Armor. The most important part of the skill, however, is that it applies Major Maim for 5 seconds, which decreases enemies' damage done by 10%. It's a massive boost to your and your team's survivability, and Major Maim doesn't have many other reliable sources, which is why Destructive Clench is so important. Next skill is Weakness to Elements, which applies Major Breach to your enemy for 30 seconds, which decreases their armor by almost 6000. It's the same debuff as the one applied by Puncture. The first morph is Elemental Drain, which extends the duration from 30 seconds to 60 seconds, and applies Minor Magicka Steel, which causes you and your allies to restore 168 Magicka every second, while attacking the affected enemy. Minor Magicka Steel is important, but it also gets applied by the Overcharged status effect, which has a chance to be procced by any magic damage, which means that your damage dealers will most likely keep it up by themselves anyway, so it isn't that useful. The second morph is Elemental Susceptibility, which applies Burning, Chilled and Concussed status effects every 7.5 seconds. Burning applies a damage over time, which won't deal much damage with tank stats. Chilled applies Minor Maim and additionally Minor Brittle for 4 seconds, if you're wielding a nice stuff, and Minor Breach if the enemy is standing in Frost Wall of Elements. Concussed applies Minor Vulnerability for 4 seconds, which increases enemy's damage taken by 5%, and Off Balance if the enemy is standing in Lightning Wall of Elements. So this skill will provide 53% uptime of minor vulnerability on its own, and also minor brittle if you're holding a nice stuff. It's really difficult to explain when you should be using it, because there's so many variables here. It's a source of major breach, so you should use it if you're not using puncture, and nobody else is providing major breach. If you have a necromancer in your group, they can easily provide major breach with unnerving boneyard without losing anything. Dragon knights can provide it with noxious breath, but you really want to have at least one dragon knight using its other morph, engulfing flames. So Noxious Breath is only an option with two or more Dragon Knights. Another thing to consider is Minor Vulnerability and Minor Brittle can be applied by other members of your group. 
Wardens and Arcanists can take care of these debuffs and provide better uptime than you would with Elemental Susceptibility. But if they're absent in your team composition, then 53% uptime from Elemental Susceptibility is better than nothing. Another reason to use this skill could be providing consistent concussion in order to trigger Lightning Elemental Blockades of Balance. But this is only useful in organized groups, because your damage dealers need to use the Exploiter Champion Point to make use of it, which isn't something people usually use by default. And the last useful skill from the skill line is Impulse. When activated, it causes an explosion around you, dealing frost damage and applying minor protection to your allies for 6 seconds, reducing their damage taken by 5%. While this effect alone might not be enough to warrant using the skill, it becomes more interesting when we look at its morph options. The Pulsar morph not only applies minor protection, but also inflicts minor mangle on small enemies, reducing their maximum health by 10%. This is particularly beneficial as a tank, since you're often the first to engage with enemies. By using Pulsar at the start of the fight, you can instantly shave off 10% of enemies' health. It's important to note that this effect doesn't work against bosses, but it shines in trash fights. Additionally, the Pulsar morph triples the chance to proc status effects. When combined with the charged trait on your eye staff, you have an almost 100% chance to proc the chilled status effect on every enemy around you. This in turn synergizes with your wall of elements. Using Pulsar inside of your wall of elements will grant several benefits. Minor protection for your teammates, reducing their damage taken by 5%. Minor mangle on enemies, reducing their maximum health by 10%. Chilled status effect, which procs minor maim, decreasing enemies damage down by 5%. Since you're wielding an eye staff, the chilled status effect will also proc minor brittle, increasing your enemy's critical damage taken by 10%. Minor breach, which reduces your enemy's armor by almost 3000, resulting in around a 6% damage increase, since the chilled enemies will be in your wall of elements, and a 40% movement speed debuff on affected enemies. That's a lot of benefits from just a single skill cast, making Pulsar an excellent choice when combined with your wall of elements. As for the destruction stuff passives, it's important to note that you'll actually want to skip one of them. The Trifocus passive, while initially seeming beneficial, can actually be a detriment to your sustain. This passive causes your heavy attacks to grant you a damage shield, and makes your block cost much kinds of stamina when wielding an eye stuff. While the damage shield might appear useful, the downside is that blocking with Trifocus completely stops your magicka recovery, instead of your stamina recovery. This is not ideal since most of your skills cost magicka, so using Trifocus could resolve in a shortage of magicka and leave you with nothing to spend your stamina on. By skipping the Trifocus passive you can ensure a more balanced and efficient use of your resources, allowing for better sustain and overall performance in combat. Now let's dive into the armor skill lines. These skill lines primarily consist of passives that scale with the number of armor pieces worn in each respective type. Additionally, they offer one active skill, which can only be used when wearing 5 or more armor pieces of the corresponding type. Let's start with light armor. You'll usually wear at least one armor piece of the type, so you'll benefit slightly from its passives. However, you won't need the active skill, annulment, since it requires wearing 5 light armor pieces. When it comes to passives, prioritize evocation, which improves your magicka sustain, and spell warding, which increases your spell resistance. Once you have an abundance of skill points, consider investing in grace and prodigy as well. It's worth noting that light armor also has inherent bonuses and penalties, regardless of skill point allocation. The bonuses are, each piece of light armor reduces damage taken from magical attacks by 1%. Magical damage types include magic, flame, shock, and frost. Each piece reduces the cost of dodge by 3%. And the penalties. Each piece increases damage taken from martial attacks by 1%. Martial damage types include physical, poison, disease, and bleed. Each piece increases the cost of block by 3%. Now let's move on to medium armor. Similar to light armor, it's common to wear at least one piece of medium armor, providing you with some passive benefits. The active skill evasion, specifically the elude morph, can prove useful in certain encounters, for example when off-tanking in Asylum Sanctorium. Evasion grants you major evasion, reducing damage taken from AoE attacks by 20%. Elude significantly extends this buff and grants you major expedition for 3 seconds after being hit by a direct AoE attack, boosting your movement speed by 30%. Personally, I prefer using more heavy armor pieces and obtaining major expedition from a different skill, but Elude works exceptionally well and can make you extremely fast when wearing 5 medium armor pieces. When it comes to passives, prioritize Windwalker, which enhances your stamina sustain, and Athletics, which reduces the cost of dodge and increases sprint speed. Dexterity and Agility are also valuable passives to invest in, once you have an abundance of skill points. It's important to note that Medium Armor also provides inherent bonuses, regardless of skill point allocation. Here are the bonuses. Each piece of Medium Armor reduces the cost of block by 3%, 
and after using roll dodge, each piece reduces damage taken from AoE attacks by 2% for 2 seconds. And lastly, let's discuss heavy armor, which is our primary armor type. In most cases, you'll be wearing 5 heavy armor pieces, allowing you to really benefit from its passives. The active skill Unstoppable provides several buffs. It grants major resolve for 20 seconds and it provides 6 seconds of crowd control immunity. However, during the crowd control immunity, your movement speed is reduced by 65%. While the base ability of Unstoppable has limited utility, its morph, Immovable, is absolutely essential for Sentinel encounters. One example is Hard Mode Zalvaka in Rogrove. The Immovable morph grants you 5% block mitigation per heavy armor piece equipped and increases the strength of the snare by 5% per heavy armor piece. Both effects last for 6 seconds, just like the crowd control immunity. It's worth noting that if you were to use Immovable with a total of 7 heavy armor pieces, the snare's strength would reach 100%, completely immobilizing you and preventing dodge rolling as well. When it comes to the passives, it's highly recommended to invest in all of them, as they all provide significant benefits. Heavy Armor also offers inherent bonuses and penalties, independent of skill point allocation. Here are the bonuses. Each piece of Heavy Armor reduces damage taken from martial attacks by 1%. Each piece increases your block mitigation by 1%. While immune to crowd control, each piece reduces damage taken by 1%. And the penalties. Each piece of Heavy Armor increases damage taken from magical attacks by 1%, and each piece increases the cost of roll dodge by 3%. Now moving on to guild skill lines, and starting with the fighter's guild. The first skill is Silver Bolts, which is a simple ranged spammable. It's not really useful on its own. However, it can be morphed into Silver Leash, which is fundamental skill for tanks. Silver Leash will pull an enemy towards you, snare them and taunt them if they haven't already been taunted. You'll use it in every trash fight and in boss fights which include additional adds. Next is Circle of Protection, and once again, we're only interested in its morph, as the base ability offers us basically nothing. Ring of Preservation Morph places a circle on the ground for 10 seconds that heals you and your allies inside of it for 1.9% of your maximum stamina or maximum magicka plus 19.7% of your weapon or spell damage. This is similar to the healing Extended Ritual does, except Ritual lasts longer and comes with other benefits, such as the Purify Synergy or proccing the Sacred Ground passive, so it takes priority over a Circle of Protection. And because of that you will very rarely be able to fit in your skill bar. But if you do manage to fit it in, it can be a nice additional heal over time. As for passives, you'll definitely want the Intimidating Presence, which reduces the stamina cost of your Fighter's Guild abilities by 15%, because you'll be using Silver Leash a lot. The Slayer passive will increase your weapon and spell damage by 3% for each Fighter's Guild ability slotted. This will boost your healing abilities, but most of the time your Fighter's Guild abilities will land on your back bar, so you won't get much benefit out of it. It's something you want to get only when you have spare skill points. Same with Banish the Wicked passive. Getting more ultimate is always nice, but this only works on killing blows, and you won't be getting many of those as a tank. Next up we have Mage's Guild. First skill we wanna look at is Entropy, or rather it's Morph, Structured Entropy. This skill puts a 20 second damage over time on an enemy, which becomes 24 seconds with the Everlasting Magic passive. Every 2 seconds you'll be healed for 1.7% of your maximum stamina or maximum magicka, plus 19.7% of your weapon or spell damage. So healing per second from this skill is half of what you'd get from Extended Ritual or Circle of Protection. What makes this ability really strong is that you can place it on multiple enemies to stack up lots of healing over time on yourself. And even though it isn't a staple ability, I found it extremely useful in, for example, Dreadsea Reef's first boss. The next skill is Equilibrium, which allows you to trade health for Magicka. However, using Equilibrium will reduce the strength of your healing and damage shields by 50% for 4 seconds. You can use it to improve your magicka sustain, though I never ended up needing it, so I think you also won't need it if your Templar is built properly. But I wanted to make you aware of this tool. The Balance Morph grants you Major Resolve for 30 seconds, which you should already have from Rune Focus. The Spell Symmetry Morph reduces the cost of your next magicka ability by 33%. If you're going to use any Mage's Guild skill, you should get the Mage Adept, Everlasting Magic and Magicka Controller passives. Next we have the Sigic Order skill line. The first skill I want to discuss is Time Stop. I have to mention that it's an extremely niche skill and not a priority to invest a skill point in. Time Stop allows you to stun enemies in an 8 meter radius for 3 seconds. Personally, I found it to be useful only in the Vicosa boss fight in Moonhunter Keep Dungeon. However, I decided to mention it so you know the option exists and perhaps you'll find it useful in other situations. If you decide to use Time Stop, I recommend using the Time Freeze Morph to remove the 2 second cast time, which can be quite annoying. 
Moving on we have Accelerate, which is again rather niche, but also absolutely essential in a few fights. Accelerate grants you major expedition buff for 4 seconds, increasing your movement speed by 30%. It also grants minor force for 20 seconds, increasing your critical damage by 10%. While the minor force buff is not crucial for us as tanks, the reason Accelerate is truly essential is because of its morph. Race against time. This morph not only removes snares and immobilizations, but also provides you with 2 seconds of immunity to them. One fight where this skill is extremely important is when off-tanking Navintas. The statues in that fight will put a stacking snare on you, which eventually becomes so strong that you won't be able to move. To counter this, you'll need to use the race against time to remove the snare. Additionally, the major expedition buff provided by race against time will be highly useful in that fight. Lastly, let's discuss Undo. This ultimate skill allows you to go back in time by 4 seconds, resetting your position, health, stamina and magicka to what they were at that moment. However, you're not meant to use it actively. The reason this ultimate can be useful is because of its morph, Temporal Guard. This morph will passively grant you minor protection while slotted, reducing your damage taken by 5%. While this ultimate is extremely important for other classes, it's not as vital for Templars, since you already receive minor protection from spear wall passive. However, I wanted you to understand why that's the case. So if you ever decide to unslot Raiden Ward, you should slot Temporal Guard on your front bar to make up for the missing minor protection. When it comes to passives, if you're planning to use Time Freeze or Race Against Time, I recommend acquiring the Clairvoyance passive, which reduces the cost of Psychic skills by 15%. And if you're using any Psychic skill, it's worth getting the Concentrated Barrier passive, which grants you a small damage shield when you start blocking. Let's dive into the Undaunted skill line now. First we have Blood Altar, which is an essential skill to have in every fight. While it doesn't necessarily need to be run by you, someone in your group should use it on every boss fight, as it greatly enhances survivability. When Blood Altar is placed down, every enemy within a 28 meter radius will constantly be afflicted with minor lifesteal. This effect restores 600 health to your allies whenever they attack these enemies, up to once every second. However, the more important aspect of this skill is the synergy it provides. When your allies' health drops to a low level, they can activate the Blood Funnel synergy, healing them for 40% of their maximum health. Like all synergies, it can be used once every 20 seconds, but it gets even stronger. The Overflowing Altar Morph instead grants the Blood Fist synergy, which restores 65% of your allies' maximum health when they use it. This can be a lifesaver in many situations. Moving on, we have Trapping Webs. This ability places a web on the ground that deals damage, slows enemies, and explodes after 10 seconds. However the, most, however, the most crucial aspect is that it grants a single use of the Spawn Broodling Synergy to your ranged allies, which summons a spider. Unfortunately, due to the ranged requirement, this synergy is quite niche, as your ally needs to be really far away to activate it. However, in certain situations, like in Asylum Sanctorium, where your allies need to be distant from the main boss, they can utilize this synergy. I recommend using the Shadow Silk Morph, as it grants the summoned spider a strong damage over time effect. Next we have Inner Fire. This is the second of the two ranged taunts available in the game, but it is considered the weaker option. It has a range of 28 meters, just like Destructive Clench, but deals magic damage. The additional benefit is it provides a 50% chance to provide a single use of the Radiate Synergy. Similar to Trapping Webs, this synergy can only be used by ranged allies, making it somewhat problematic to use in most situations. The Inner Rage Morph increases the chance of providing a synergy from 50% to 100%. The Inner Beast morph changes the cost from Magicka to Stamina and increases your own damage dealt to the taunted enemy by 10%. This morph is useful when you're trying to contribute DPS as a tank. However, in traditional tanking scenarios, I have found Inner Fire and its morphs to be useful only in one situation. There is a monster set called Noon Attack that procs on frost damage, but you don't want to activate it randomly. Instead, you want to trigger it in a cluster of enemies. So, the other range taunt, Destructive Clench, deals frost damage, which means that you would accidentally proc Noon Attack on the very first enemy you taunt. In this specific niche situation, you would use Inner Fire for taunting instead. The next skill is Bond Shield. It grants you a damage shield equal to 30% of your maximum health, which is almost identical to the shield you get from the Defensive Stance skill in the One Handed and Shield skill line. However, Bond Shield also grants your allies a single use of the Bond Wall Synergy. When used, this synergy provides them and up to 5 other allies with a damage shield equal to 33% of their maximum health. It's important to note that if you receive the damage shield from someone else using the Bone Wall synergy, it will trigger the 20 second cooldown for you as well. This means that you can't use Bone Shield and have your allies use it one by one. In content such as Foreman Dungeons, if one person activates the synergy, it goes on cooldown for everyone, 
assuming they were within range to receive the shield. For optimal usage, I recommend using the Bone Surge morph. This morph changes the synergy to Spinal Surge, which not only provides the damage shield, but also grants everyone affected by the shield Major Vitality for 6 seconds. Major Vitality increases their healing received by 16%, and it's a rather rare buff. Bone Surge is an excellent skill to enhance your group's survivability against mechanics that deal significant damage to the entire group, such as for example the Choking Pestilence mechanic from Balsnor Dungeon's final boss, Matriarch Lady Talvani. Moving on, we have Necrotic Orb. This skill sends an orb slowly floating forward, dealing damage to all enemies around it. It also provides a crucial synergy to allies, dealing damage and restoring 4000 of their dominant resource when activated. The first morph, Mystic Orb, increases all of your recoveries by 100, while the orb is active. The second morph, Energy Orb, transforms the orb and the synergy to heal allies instead of damaging enemies. The synergy is essential for sustaining resources, but most of the time you won't have to use it yourself because someone else in the group will already do so. The Necrotic Orb ability itself might not be the best damaging skill, but it's still competitive with others. Healers often use the Energy Orb skill, which means it's typically covered in Trials and in Dungeons when you have a dedicated healer. It's worth noting that the synergy shares cooldown with the synergy from Spear Shards, but the Combustion synergy is better because it additionally either deals damage or heals. And on top of that, Combustion can be used by all of your group members after a single cast, unlike Spear Shards. Overall, as a tank, it's unlikely that you'll need to use Necrotic Orb frequently because it's easy to rely on others for it. However, if nobody happens to run it in your group, you can provide significant sustain and damage by using it yourself. As for the Undaunted passives, you'll want both of them. Next up we have the Assault skill line. It's worth noting that all skills from the skill line will proc the powerful Assault item set. First skill is Vigor. It grants you and your allies in an 8 meter radius a 10 second heal over time effect. It's a decent heal, especially in a trial environment where your weapon damage will be buffed by other supports. It's also the skill you'll be proccing powerful assault set with most of the time. The first morph, Resolving Vigor, doesn't heal your allies anymore, heals you for a higher amount in half the time and grants you the minor resolve buff for 20 seconds, which increases your armor by almost 3000. Minor resolve is essential which is why you'll be using this morph most of the time. The other morph, Echoing Vigor, increases the duration from 10 to 16 seconds and increases the radius from 8 to 50 meters. You can get away with using this morph in fights which are easy to tank. Next skill is Rapid Maneuver. This skill grants you and your allies within 28 meters a major expedition for 8 seconds, which increases movement speed by 30%. It's also worth noting that this skill is very expensive and costs 6426 stamina without any modifiers. The morph you'll want to use is Charging Maneuver, which also grants minor expedition for the duration which increases movement speed by 15%. This morph also has its cost reduced to 6156. I use this skill in trash fights in trials just so our group can move faster towards the next trash pack, but this is obviously not necessary and it's just a time saver. There are however places where charging maneuver will be actually really useful and not just a time saver. One example is a Lord Falgraven fight in Kind Ages trial. There's a mechanic where your team has to run around the arena and form a line in order to interrupt him while he's channeling an ability that will eventually kill your entire team. And Charging Maneuver is extremely helpful in that phase. And with 28 meters range, you should be able to reach your entire team when timed correctly. Next skill is Caltrops. It places an 8 meter AoE that deals damage and slows enemies inside of it by 50%. The reason you'll want to use it is because of one of its morphs, Razor Caltrops, which applies major breach to all enemies inside of it, reducing their armor by almost 6000, providing around a 13% damage increase. It's extremely good for trash fights. And the last useful skill from Assault skill line, and a very important one, Warhorn. This is the ultimate you'll be using most of the time. It costs 250 ultimate and applies a buff to you and all allies within 20 meters, that increases their max stamina and max magicka by 10%. This translates to roughly 300 weapon and spell damage, so it's comparable to the bonus powerful Assault provides. And it gets even better when it's morphed. The aggressive horn morph also provides major force for 10 seconds, increasing your allies critical damage done by 20%. It's a massive boost to your group's DPS. As for assault passives, none of them affect PvE combat, but you'll definitely want to put a single point into continuous attack to get the permanent major gallop, which will increase your movement speed while mounted by 30%. Next we have the support skill line. Starting off with Siege Shield, its morph, Propelling Shield, increases the range of abilities with a range of at least 20 meters by 7 meters, 
while you are standing inside of it. It's going to be really useful in some encounters. Next we have Purge. It's a very expensive ability that will cleanse up to 3 effects from you and your allies within 18 meters. It's extremely useful in some places, such as for example the first boss in the host of Fabrication Trial, Hunter Killer Fabricants. You'll want to use the efficient Purge Morph to make the cost a bit more bearable. Next skill is Guard. This skill allows you to form a link between you and another group member, which transfers 30% of the damage they take to you. The link has a range limit of 50 meters. There will be fights where one of the tanks, usually the main tank, but sometimes the off tank, takes significantly more damage than the other. In those fights, the tank with the easier job will guard the other tank to help them survive. One of its morphs, Mystic Guard, also provides constant minor vitality, which increases healing received by 8%, and it's quite a rare buff with very few other sources. Next skill is Revealing Flare, and it's an extremely important skill for a tank. Activating the skill itself exposes invisible enemies which you'll never find useful in PvE, but it also passively grants you major protection, which decreases your damage taken by 10%, which is huge. It's basically trading a skill slot for 10% damage mitigation. You can also get major protection from explosive charge, but with this skill you don't need to cast anything to keep it up, and it also procs the magic guide passive increasing your magicka recovery by 10%. And last, we have the Barrier Ultimate. It costs 250 ultimate and grants you and your allies within 12 meters a massive damage shield for 30 seconds. This is the best ultimate when you need to help your group survive, rather than increasing its DPS with the Horn ult. The Replenishing Barrier Morph is the better one, as the healing you gain from Reviving Barrier is very small, so it's better to get some ultimate back from Replenishing Morph, to be able to gather enough ultimate for the next barrier faster. As for support passives, you'll absolutely want the Magic Guide. It will increase your magic recovery by 10% for each support ability slotted. Now let's talk about the Vampire skill line. Being a Vampire can be situationally very useful, but you need to be aware of its drawbacks. There are two ways of utilizing the Vampire skill line. You can stay on stage 1 and gain access to Accelerating Drain, an ability which is a 3 second channel that generates 20 ultimate. It can be very useful when you don't have much to do, and you're not under pressure so you can constantly channel to generate a lot of ultimate and spend it to increase your group's DPS with Horn or increase its survivability with Barrier. Being a Vampire will also allow you to use Mistform, which allows you to dash ahead and absorb projectiles. It can be very useful in some situations. For example, in Cloud Rest, this can entirely absorb Smudge's heavy attack. After morphing it to Elusive Mist, you'll also get Major Expedition and Major Evasion. Being a stage 1 vampire will increase the cost of all your non-vampire abilities by 3%, increase your flame damage taken by 5%, and decrease your health recovery by 10%. You could also be a stage 3 vampire and also gain access to the undeath passive, which reduces your damage taken by up to 30% based on missing health. That's a lot of damage mitigation, but being a stage 3 vampire will increase the cost of your non-vampire abilities by 8%, increase your flame damage taken by 13%, and reduce your health recovery by 60%. It's very strong, but you need to be able to play around the sustain issues it causes. Keep in mind you can switch between Vampire and Non-Vampire using the Armory Station. You should switch the Vampirism off if you don't plan on using Exhilarating Drain, Mist Form, or utilizing Undeath Passive, so you don't have to deal with the drawbacks. And the very last thing I have to mention regarding skills, or rather passives, you'll actually need one of the passives from Craft skill lines, specifically from Alchemy. You'll need Medicinal Use passive to increase the duration of bonuses you gain from potions. And now we've come to the end of the skill descriptions. Now let's move on to creating skill setups for specific encounters. It's important to know that making skill setups will vary greatly between PC and console players. PC players have the advantage of using add-ons that allow them to instantly swap entire skill setups, either through keybinds or automatically when approaching a specific boss. This means PC players can specialize their setups for each encounter. On the other hand, console players will need to create setups that work effectively against both trash mobs and bosses. However, even for console players, there are situations where it might be worth taking the time to adjust your skills, especially when facing particularly challenging bosses. Keep in mind that the setups I'm going to show are just suggestions, and some base to build off of. You will always get better results by adjusting for each fight, and in the previous part of this video I mentioned every useful skill for you to choose from. It might seem overwhelming, it is overwhelming, but that's a great thing that adds depth to the game and makes it much more enjoyable when you eventually learn it all. I'm always going to show the trash setup first, then the boss setup, and then the merged setup for both trash and bosses for console players to use. 
I'll keep skill descriptions very short since I talked about them all in the previous part of this video. Let's start with the trash setup for dungeons. The first, most important skill is obviously taunt. And we're gonna use pierce armor. Next, razor caltrops. It's absolutely necessary to keep up major breach on all enemies. And it will also slow them down by 50%. It's the skill you'll want to start fights with. Next is either living dark or honor the dead. If you're the only Templar and there are no Dragon Knights, and there's a decent chance that will be the case in dungeons, you'll need Living Dark to proc minor sorcery with the Illuminate passive. And on top of that, Living Dark itself isn't too bad in trash. There will be lots of enemies attacking you, so you'll be proccing that 2000 heal constantly, and you'll be slowing them down. If you don't need to provide minor sorcery, you can use Honor the Dead as a more reliable heal. Next is Power Bash. The skill you'll need to activate the Void Bash item set, which will pull enemies in towards you. You'll obviously want to swap it out to something else when not using Void Bash. My suggestion is Revealing Flare, but you can experiment there, as I haven't tested different options because I simply always use Vatish Runs for the board. And last, Radiant Ward, your main defensive tool. The damage shield will reach a very high value in Trash, and it will also grant you minor protection by triggering the Spear Wall passive. And the front bar ultimate, Replenishing Barrier. Even if you don't end up using it, it will provide a passive 10% additional magic recovery through the magic aid passive. On bug bar, we'll start off with restoring focus, because we need the major resolve buff. It will also help us with sustaining stamina. Next, silver leash. You'll need it to pull enemies in, so that they can die faster in your allies' AoEs. Frost clench is our range taunt. It has a 28 meters range, so if a trash pack has some particularly dangerous adds, you should start by casting frost clench at them. You could give up this skill and use Silver Leash as your ranged taunt, because it does have a soft taunt, but Silver Leash has a shorter range of 22 meters, and doing so might also cause issues with sustaining stamina. You'll need Blockade of Frost as it will synergize with Pulsar. Blockade will apply Minor Breach and a 40% slow to all enemies sitting inside who are also chilled. Pulsar will chill your enemies, apply Minor Maim, Minor Brittle and Minor Mangle. It will also apply Minor Protection to your teammates. As for Bagbara ultimate, you want to use Aggressive Warhorn. The increased resources will boost your group's damage and healing done, not to mention the 10 seconds of major force. To sum it up, there's three skills that aren't mandatory. Living Dark, Power Bash and Destructive Clench. And the few skills that you can slot instead of them are the previously mentioned Honor the Dead and Revealing Flare, but also Extended Ritual or a Restoring Aura. Now moving on to boss setups. And here it gets a bit more tricky and changes a lot depending on the rest of your team. This is the base setup for an environment where you don't trust your teammates to provide anything. So for example when queuing alone with the dungeon finder, which by the way I think you absolutely shouldn't do because it's a trap. The random queue is filled with damage dealers who have zero clue about the game, and you as a tank are in demand and can very easily get into pre-made groups instead. So what changes compared to the trash setup from before? You swap out caltrops to extended ritual. Instead of power bash you'll use honor the dead, as you won't get away without a proper heal in most boss fights. And instead of Pulsar, you'll use Blood Altar to massively increase your group's survivability. In some fights, you won't need Silver Leash, and then you can slot Radiant Aura. But if you're only making a single boss setup, definitely keep Silver Leash. You won't need it in most fights, but if you end up not having it in a fight with Ads, it's gonna cause lots of issues. Also, you won't need Radiant Aura if your teammates are getting the minor recovery buffs from other sources. But this setup obviously won't work for every boss. Some fights will straight up require situational skills like Crushing Shock, Immovable, Revealing Flare, etc. Not to mention being forced to use an Assault skill when using the powerful Assault set. So which skills from the setup I've shown are the first to go? If you're playing with a healer in your group, they should definitely be the one to use Overflowing Altar, so you can unslot it. If there's a Dragon Knight or another Templar in the group, you don't need Living Dark. It could still come useful in fights with lots of enemies, but it's just not a requirement anymore. So now to give you some examples. These would be my builds, for last bosses of some dungeons and hard modes. Moon Hunter Keep without a healer, and with a healer, Fangler without a healer, and with a healer, Stone Garden without a healer, and with a healer. If you're a console player who cannot quickly switch their skills, you should use the base boss setup with Silver Leash everywhere. I feel like this setup can tackle any trash and most bosses. Most because for those few very difficult ones, like for example in Stone Garden, you really should ask your team to give you a minute to swap stuff around manually. Now moving on to trials and starting off again with trash setup. I will simply list the changes compared to dungeon boss setup 
so I don't have to repeat myself as much. A double Ice Staff Stab is better here, but first let me show you a setup with Sword and Board. Instead of Blood Altar, you'll want to use Pulsar. And instead of Extended Ritual, you'll want to use Charging Maneuver. Charging Maneuver is not really needed, it's just a matter of convenience. And it just makes you reach the next rush back faster. I assume that in a 12-man group, there surely would be some Necromancer providing Major Breach with their unnerving Boneyard. But in pack groups, you might want to swap Charging Maneuver to Razor Cutrops. In optimized groups, that want to utilize the Alkosh item set, you'll need Extended Ritual, which I just told you to unslot for Charging Maneuver. But in optimized groups like these, there just has to be a Dragon Knight providing minor brutality, so you can safely unslot Living Dark. It's better to use double Ice Staff setup, because this way you can use a charged Ice Staff on your front bar to amplify Pulsar, and an infused Ice Staff back bar to amplify your Crusher enchant. Here's the skill setup for double Ice Staff. Now moving on to trial boss setups. This is going to be extremely similar to base boss dungeon setup. First difference will be that you absolutely won't need overflowing altar in trials, because you'll always have a healer in those. Once again, you can support your group better with a double ice staff setup, but there's one difference compared to trash setups. It's usually easier to survive with a sword and board, because you can get your stamina back by heavy attacking, and you can utilize skills such as defensive stance or pierce armor combined with puncture and gravity set. Trash packs are usually trivial compared to bosses, so personally, I just use ice staves there and forget about any new ones. But for bosses, you really should think about what you're going up against and consider if maybe using sword and board wouldn't be better for a specific fight. Other than that, everything I've said about situational skills in the dungeon boss setup section of this video applies here, so I won't be repeating that. But I'll show you a few examples. These would be my builds for bosses of some trials and hard modes. For main tanking Flame Herald Basse, also does the type of fight where I'd use stage 3 vampirism for main tanking Zalvaka, and for main tanking Yolnakrin. And that's it for the skill setup part of this video. Just a friendly reminder, the key to getting better results is to adjust your skills based on the situation. There are a bunch of things you need to consider when setting up your skills, like who's on your team and the type of enemy you're going up against. So don't forget about all those niche skills that come in handy only in specific situations. Experiment a bit and see what works best for you. Now moving on to gear, I'm gonna talk about armor weight, traits and enchants, then the same for weapons, and then the same for jewelry. I'll talk about item sets later on. One very important thing for console players, once again, you're at a disadvantage because you won't be able to quickly switch your gear with add-ons. Well, for skills I was showing a compromise setup for console players, I won't be doing that with gear as it's more straightforward here. Simply use the boss gear everywhere and don't optimize for trash at all. So. Other than the armor passives I've talked about before, the three armor types also provide different amounts of armor, with heavy providing the most, then medium, and then light. The armor value also varies depending on the body part the armor goes on. A chest piece provides the most armor, then legs, head, shoulder and boots provide the same amount of armor, and then gloves and belt provide very little armor. You'll want to use at least one piece of every armor type to trigger the Undaunted Metal passive from the Undaunted skill line. So most of the time you'll be wearing 5 heavy, 1 medium and 1 light. You'll be able to fit in two 5-piece item sets and a single 2-piece monster set that comes only in the form of head and shoulder pieces. It's easier to work on examples, so let's say we're using two heavy 5-piece sets, Turning Tight and Pearlescent Ward, and we're using Arch Druid as our monster set. In this scenario, which is the most common one, these are the weights you're going to use. You're basically forced into heavy on 5 of those pieces, but you can use any weight you want on your head and shoulder. So you'll want light and medium to get the full value of undaunted metal. Changing the medium piece to light will reduce your magical damage taken, but also reduce your maximum resources including max health. So while it might make sense against magic damage that scales with max HP, such as the Basse fight, it's still better to keep the medium piece against magic damage that doesn't scale with max HP, such as in the fight against Smaja. It's impossible to show you all the combinations because there's so many variables, but let me show you two more examples. Let's say you're wearing Turning Tide, Olorim, and once again arch through it. In this setup you could shift the weights a bit and have your belt be light, because belt provides very little armor anyway, so the difference between heavy and light is 516, while for head and shoulder, the difference between heavy and light is 1204, and you're able to have a light belt because one of your body sets is Olorim. The second example is the same thing, but with powerful assault, which is a medium set. I hope this gives you the idea. Now let's move on to traits. Out of 10 traits, we're only gonna look at 6 of them. Reinforced, which increases items armor by 
Nernhold, which increases items armor by 253. Divines, which increases Mundo Stone effects by 9.1%. I haven't talked about Mundo Stones yet, but all you need to know for now is that this 9.1% translates into 27 additional magic recovery. Invigorating, which increases health, stamina and magic recovery by 16. Sturdy, which reduces the cost of block by 4%. And Well Fitted, which reduces the cost of Roll Dodge by 6%. The first step is getting enough Reinforce or Nernhold pieces to reach the armor cap. Reinforce becomes better than Nernhold on pieces which have base armor value higher than 1581. There is also a lot of other variables that will have an impact on our armor, such as race, item set bonuses, champion points or weapon type. After you've hit the armor cap, Divines is the best default trait to put on remaining pieces. And by default I mean it's the best all around trait that you should have on your first set of armor. Invigorating is not far behind in terms of magic recovery and also gives you some stamina recovery, so it's a viable option. And I would even say it's better if you have a decent amount of stamina abilities. Sturdy can be situationally best for some encounters where you're forced to hold block for a long time, such as for example the Valina and Lamikai boss in Scrivener's Whole Dungeon. Sturdy can also be good for beginner players who are mindlessly holding block when they shouldn't, or when you're using the Worldmaster Slotable Champion Point which kind of forces you into this perma-blocking gameplay to benefit from the damage reduction. Well-fitted, similarly to sturdy, can be situationally best for some specific encounters, where you're forced to dojo a lot, such as for example the Reef Guardian boss in Dreadsea Reef Trial. Now these will be the traits I'd use on a North Templar tank, with no additional armor from item set bonuses, fortified and bulwark champion points, minor resolve buff from resolving vigor, and with an ice staff front bar, which means no additional armor from shield. If I were for an example an Imperial, I would need to make up for the missing armor which I would get from North Racial in previous setup. I could do that by always sticking to a sword and board and never utilizing double eye stuff setup. Then after changing all my traits to Reinforce and Nernhound, I could get really close to the armor cap. If I really wanted to use double eye stuff setup on an Imperial, I could also use the Lady Mundus, which grants 2744 armor. I would lose a lot of magic recovery, but Lady would offset missing out on North Ragged passive which grants 2600 armor, so we could go back to the trait setup I presented for Nord, but with one less Nernhound, because Lady gives more armor than Nord passive. With Lady Mundus, Divines isn't giving you magic recovery anymore, it's giving armor, so you should use Invigorating instead if you want sustain. And when you want to use the situational traits, like Sturdy or Well Fitted, you'd simply swap out Divines or Invigorating pieces to those, and keep Reinforce and Nernhound the way they are. Keep in mind some item sets, like for example Crimson Oath, provide armor with their set bonuses, which makes getting to the armor cap much easier. I hope that gives you the idea, because usually there will be more variables, so the setups I just showed you won't be enough. Now let's move on to enchants. There are four types of enchants you can put on your armor. Health, Stamina, Magicka and Tristat. Body enchants are simple and there's no situational stuff. Tristats are straight up best, but they're also very expensive, so before you can afford Tristat enchants, you'll want to use a mix of health, stamina and magic enchants, so that you get roughly similar amounts of all three of them. Enchants on chest, legs, helm and shield provide more, so prioritize those when upgrading to tristats. Now we're moving on to weapons. Weapons obviously don't have weights, but they have types, and that's what we're gonna start off with. As a tank you'll be using either a one-handed weapon with a shield, or an ice staff on your front bar. On your back bar you'll always be using ice staff. So how to decide which one to use in certain situation? When it comes to trash pack setups, it's very simple. You want to use one handed and shield in dungeons to utilize the void bash item set, and in trials you want to use ice stuff, so you can use pulsar on the front bar. Against bosses, let's compare the differences between one handed and shield and frost stuff. One handed and shield gets 5% weapon and spell damage, increased block mitigation against projectiles by 14%, increased movement speed while blocking, you can regenerate both stamina and magicka with heavy attacks because you have a one hand and shield on the front bar and eye stuff on back bar, you gain access to defensive stance, which is a decent damage shield that costs stamina, so it can be used in tandem with radiant ward, allowing you to spend both types of resources to gain damage shields. And a shield will grant you 1720 armor, a body enchant and an armor trait. A frost staff gets 100% increased chance to apply status effects, and you gain double the value of weapon trait and weapon enchant, compared to one handed and shield. The importance of chance to apply status effects depends on your team comp. It can be useful because shock damage has a chance to apply minor vulnerability, 
and frost damage has a chance to apply minor brittle, but these two debuffs can be much more easily provided by arcanists, who simply have to use a skill every 20 seconds. Another thing to consider is that if you're double barring ice staves, you'll most likely have the destructive clan skill on your front bar, which makes it easier to keep a major maim, which lasts only 5 seconds. And the last thing to consider is that you can generate more ultimate with an ice staff because your decisive trait, if you decide to use it, will be twice as effective. Now let's move on to traits. Out of 8 traits, we're only gonna look at 3 of them. Charged increases chance to proc stats effects by 182.5% and 365% if it's a two-handed weapon. Decisive gives you a 27.5% chance to gain one additional ultimate whenever you gain ultimate and the chance is 55% if it's a two-handed weapon. Infused increases effect of weapon enchantment by 30% and decreases their cooldown by 50%. So let's go over all content types and what kind of traits you should use there. In trash packs and dungeons, you'll absolutely want your back bar ice staff to be charged, so that your pool cell almost always applies the chilled stats effect. As for your front bar, it doesn't really make much difference, both charged and decisive would work. In trash packs and trials, you'll want your back bar ice staff to be infused to boost your crusher enchant, and your front bar ice staff to be charged, so that your pulsar always applies the chilled stats effect. Against bosses, both in dungeons and in trials, you'll absolutely want your back bar ice staff to be infused to boost your crusher enchant. Your front bar weapon should be infused with weakening enchant if you're playing without a healer and decisive otherwise. You could also utilize charged with shock enchant to provide a minor vulnerability. Now moving on to enchants, there's a lot of those but I'll only talk about a few most useful ones. Keep in mind that these values will be halved when put on a one-handed weapon. Crusher reduces enemy's armor by 1622 for 5 seconds and it has a 10 second cooldown. With the infused trait and elemental blockade you can keep it up indefinitely. Shock deals 2534 shock damage and it has a 4 second cooldown. The reason you'll want to use it is because damage from enchant has a very high base chance to proc stats effects, 20%. And with all other modifiers such as charge trait on your weapon, you'll be able to reach chance close to 100%. And shock damage procs a concussed stats effect, which applies minor vulnerability for 4 seconds. Frost deals 2534 frost damage and it has a 4 second cooldown. Same reasoning as with shock, except here we're talking about the chilled stats effect, which applies minor maim and if you're wielding a nice stuff, minor brittle. Weakening reduces enemy's weapon and spot damage by 348 for 5 seconds and it has a 10 second cooldown. With the infused trait you'll be able to keep up decent uptime on it. Hardening grants 3784 damage shield for 5 seconds and it has a cooldown of 10 seconds. Absorb Stamina, Absorb Magicka and Prismatic Onslaught. This is 1900 physical or magic damage and restores 354 Stamina, 354 Magicka or 177 Magicka and Stamina respectively. Let's go over all content types and what kind of enchants you should use there. Basically you'll want to always use Crusher on your back bar weapon. In trash packs and dungeons on your front bar you'll want to use the shock enchant. In trash packs and trials on your front bar you'll want to use the shock or front enchants. Against bosses in both dungeons and trials, you'll want to use the weakening if you don't have a healer with you, or shock if nobody else is providing minor vulnerability. If you have a healer and have minor vulnerability covered, you can use some selfish enchant of your choice. Hardening for damage shields or absorb stamina, absorb magicka or prismatic onslaught for additional sustain. One more situational thing I want to mention is that sometimes in very organized groups, against very difficult bosses, you can use a hardening enchant on your back bar and it will increase your survivability by a decent amount. I used it when off tanking Flame Herald Basse, but you have to make sure that other supports will cover Crusher instead. Now let's talk about jewelry and start with listing all the useful traits. Infused increases effectiveness of jewelry enchantments by 60%. Harmony restores 880 health, stamina and magicka whenever you activate the synergy. Swift increases movement speed by 7% and Protective increases armor by 1190. In trash fights, the best trait is Swift. The movement speed is really useful there and trash is usually easy to deal with, so you don't need the additional sustain from Harmony or Infused. Against bosses you'll want to use Infused or Harmony. And if I were to dump down the relation between them, it will be that Harmony is stronger whenever you have at least two different synergies available to you. Which means that Harmony will be better in the vast majority of situations. But Infused can be better when playing with randoms. But that's dumped down and if you want to learn more I made a separate video about it. 
Protective is something I listed as a last resort for reaching the armor cap. Using it will hurt your sustain by quite a bit, but sometimes it's better than going against a very difficult fight without being armor capped. Let's move on to jewelry enchants and I'll once again list all the useful ones. Reduce spell cost. Reduces magicka cost of all abilities by 203. Reduce skill cost. Reduces health, stamina and magicka cost of all abilities by 133. Bracing. Reduces cost of bug by 203. And it's very simple here which one you want to use. Reduce spell cost is the best one overall for your sustain. Reduce skill cost is the one you'll want to use in trash packs, because there you'll have to use silver leash quite a lot. You could also use reduce skill cost against bosses when you're using a decent amount of stamina abilities. Bracing enchant is something you can use for a bit while you're learning the game, and you're panicking and holding block a lot more than you really have to. Now item sets. You're able to fit onto yourself two 5-piece item sets and a single 2-piece monster set. There's tons of them, but fortunately I already made separate videos for those. Here's the video for 5-piece sets and here's a video for monster sets. Some of the 5-piece item sets can be one bar, which means that you can wear three of its pieces on body or jewelry and the last two pieces on your weapon slots. Doing so with a single 5-piece item will allow you to fit in a 2-piece weapon set on one of your bars. Here are the sets you could use in that case. Puncturing Remedy, if you're using Pierce Armor. Defensive Position, if you're using Defensive Stance. Void Bash, absolutely great for trash packs and dungeons. You'll need Power Bash to proc it, which I already put in the dungeon skill setup specifically for this set. Here is an example of such setup. If you were to one bar both of your 5 piece sets, and have one of them work only on your front bar, and the other one only on your back bar, you can't fit in weapon sets anymore, but you'd be able to fit in two more items on your body or jewelry. In this situation, it's best to use a mythic and one piece of the trainee set. It's also worth noting that the trainee comes in any weight, which gives you some flexibility. Unfortunately, there aren't many useful mythics for tanking. The two I can recommend are Death Dealer's Fat, but it'll be a detriment if a fight has damage that scales with max HP, and Mark and Ring of Majesty. Now let's talk about the gear you should start with. This is the crafted setup you could start with. I'm saying you could because you don't have to start with crafted gear. Turning Tide and Crimson Oath are two very good sets that come from dungeons, and normal difficulty dungeons are relatively easy. If you want, you can skip the crafted set phase and go farm these dungeons while wearing some random gear you've got from questing. To make everything a bit more clear, now I want to show a few examples of full gear sets I would use for some encounters. For dungeons without a healer, this is what I'd use in trash, and this is what I'd use against bosses. For dungeons with a healer, this is what I'd use in trash, and this is what I'd use against bosses. For pack trials, this is what I'd use as a main tank, and this is what I'd use as an off tank. Keep in mind that these are just base examples. In dungeons you'd have to bring some penetration set if your damage dealers were to wear medium armor, and in non pack trials you'd simply wear whatever your red lead tells you to. Now moving on to champion points. Just like with every other aspect of this game, a lot of the stuff here will be situational, and you'll be able to gain small bits of advantage here and there by reconfiguring and preparing for each fight on its own. The green tree doesn't impact combat, but I just want to mention that the Steed's Blessing slotable, which increases your out of combat movements by 20%, is a very good one to have for moving between trash packs. This is the order in which you should progress your blue tree. The useful blue slotables are Ironclad, which reduces damage taken from direct damage attacks by 6%, Unassailable, which reduces damage taken from damage over time attacks by 6%, Duelist's Rebuff, which reduces damage taken from single target attacks by 6%, Enduring Resolve, which reduces damage taken from area of effect attacks by 6%, Bulwark, which increases your armor by 1900 while you have a shield or frost staff equipped, which should be at all times anyway. Swift Renewal, which increases your healing over time by 10%. It will boost your extended ritual, restoring focus, but also resolving vigor, so you can get a lot out of it. I think the logic behind blue slot boss is pretty self-explanatory, but it will require some knowledge about what type of damage a certain boss deals. You'll want to use all slot balls that correspond with the type of damage you'll take in a specific encounter. For some, you'll have to use all four of them. But for most of them, 3 will be enough, which enables you to use Bulwark and increase your armor by a fair bit. This enables you to shift armor somewhere else, for example you could use different armor traits. Or you could use Swift Renewal to boost your healing. Red Tree is the most complicated one. This is the order in which you should progress it. 
Useful red slotables are Bonus Vitality, which increases your max health by 1400, Fortified, which increases your armor by 1731, Rejuvenation, which increases your health, stamina, and magical recovery by 90, Bastion, which increases the strength of your damage shields by 15%, Shieldmaster, which decreases cost of your damage shields by 10%, Racing Anchor, which increases your block mitigation by 20%, and reduces your movement speed by 16%. Wardmaster, which reduces your damage taken by 10% while blocking under the effect of a damage shield. Sustained by Suffering, which increases your health, stamina and magical recovery by 150, while you have a debuff on yourself. On Guard, which increases your block mitigation by 10% while under the effects of crowd control immunity. And some extremely niche ones, but ones I still want to mention, are Arcane Alacrity, which reduces the cost of your dodge by 800 while under the effect of a damage shield and Expert Evasion, which grants you a free dodge roll once every 30 seconds. Here's a few tips on how to set up your red slotables. Bastion will boost your Radiant Ward. It's especially good in fights with lots of enemies, where your Radiant Ward will be even stronger to begin with. Shieldmaster will reduce the cost of your Radiant Ward, saving you a decent amount of magicka. It will also reduce the ultimate cost of Barrier, if you choose to use it. Wardmaster will drain your stamina by forcing you to perma block but it'll be worth it in fights with absorbed incoming damage that normally isn't affected by block, such as for example Flame Herald Basse. Bracing Anchor is great for fights with constant direct blockable damage. On Guard will synergize with Immovable if you choose to use it, granting you even more block mitigation during that 6 second window. Boundless Vitality is great for your survivability if a fight does not have max HP based damage. Fortified can be used to reach the armor cap if you're still missing some. Rejuvenation is a decent boost to sustain when you have some slots left. Sustained by Suffering is a straight up stronger rejuvenation that only works in some fights, but there's a decent amount of fights where you have a constant debuff on yourself. Now let's talk about race. Sadly the game isn't very balanced here and you'll be handicapping yourself by a decent amount by not choosing Nord for their bonus armor, because armor is very hard to get from other sources. It is possible to obtain but that forces you to sacrifice other good stuff, such as the Atrank Mundus or Sustain Jewelry Traits. Then there's also Nord's Ultimate Generation passive, which at first sight might seem similar to Imperial's Cost Reduction passive, but Nord's Ultigen passive works better with sets like Saxdeal or War Machine, which are quite commonly worn on tanks. You can still make it work, it's just going to be harder to play. You still gotta make sure to be armor capped against more difficult encounters, even if it means giving up the Atrank Mundus for Lady, or giving up Sustain Jewelry traits for protective. If you want to learn the differences between each race in more detail, I made a separate video about it. Now moving on to Munduses. This part is actually very straightforward, because the best Mundus stone is by far the Achanak, which grants 310 magical recovery. You can find it in the places shown on the screen. It can also be placed in houses, so some guild halls might have it there. You can also use the Lady Mundus, which I mentioned multiple times when talking about race. Lady Mundus increases your armor by 2744. Now attributes. Most of the time it's best to put all your points into health. It'll increase your survivability and increase scaling on most of your abilities. Having bigger resource capacity is useful but not at the cost of health. The only exception is when your max magicka would be higher than your max stamina due to for example ratios or items and bonuses. In that case you should put just enough points into stamina so that your max stamina is higher than your max magicka so that it's considered your dominant resource, for the sake of the combustion synergy. The best food is Orzorgao's Smoke Bear Hunch, which will increase your max health and all recoveries. There's also a cheaper alternative called Jewels of Misrule, which provides only slightly less stats. Sometimes it'll be beneficial to lower your max health, for example during the execute phase in the Cloudrest. Candid Jester's Coin is one example of a food that's good for that. Moving on to potions. Most of the time you'll want to use the Tristat potions, which restore all of your resources and boost their recoveries by 30%. You can craft them by combining Columbine, Bugloss and Mountain's Flower. A better alternative, though much more expensive, are Heroism potions, which boost your ultimate generation instead of restoring health. You can craft them by combining Columbine, Dragon's Blood and Dragon Reum. And that's it for this video. If you have any more questions, you can comment down below or join our Discord server Wildheart and use the tank channel for it. I'm planning on making a written version at some point, and when I'm done with that, you'll be able to find it on the ESOU website.
As always, feedback will be appreciated. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel and check out my Twitch. Thanks for watching and see you next time.